we are trying to understand the basic nature of stem cells. You see, if we really have to take stem cells to patients and make sure that they are safe, they are effective, they do not, let's say, form tumors, one has to first understand what is a stem cell and what all regulates a stem cell. And it's important to have uh, sufficient information about stem cells so that once we reach the stage where we can put them into patients, we do not have unnecessary side effects. So one of the things we are looking at in the lab, which is really not uh, heavily studied in the field of stem cells, is to understand how the movement of molecules within uh, stem cells can regulate or affect their choice of fate when they differentiate. And this involves the process of vesicular trafficking or endocytosis, which is uh, basically using these membrane-bound vesicles to transport molecules to different parts of the cell, specifically from the plasma membrane to within and from inside to outside. Hey, hi, welcome to Biotech Talks. Now, today in this episode of Biotech Talks, we are going to get to know about stem cells. Now, stem cells, as you all know, have a lot of potential to cure cell-based disorders, right? But most of these therapies are in the experimental stage. And the reason for that is we don't know enough about stem cells. And we need to be very careful before introducing a stem cell into a patient. Okay, we need to be sure about the type of cell that we are getting after differentiating a stem cell. So what are stem cells? What are the application of stem cells? What makes a stem cell stem cell? That is what we are going to get to know today in this episode of Biotech Talk. So today with us we have Dr. Deepa Subramanyam, a scientist at National Center of Cell Sciences. In her lab, she is studying the movement of molecules within stem cells, how these movements are related to the differentiation of stem cells into specific type of cells. So a mind-blowing research and a wonderful person to explain it. I hope you enjoy today's episode of Biotech Talks. Hello ma'am, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? I'm good ma'am. So what are stem cells? So stem cells are cells which as the name suggests uh, give rise to uh, different cell types. Different cell types originate from them. Um, loosely speaking, there are around three types of stem cells. Uh, embryonic stem cells, adult stem cells, and then induced pluripotent stem cells. Now, embryonic stem cells, as the name suggests, are found in the embryo. They're found in very early stages of the embryo, and they give rise to the entire organism or the entire, um, uh, yeah, to the entire organism. So as you can imagine, they're just a handful of cells. They exist for a very short time during the duration of development, but one can take these cells out from early embryos and put them into culture in a dish and use them to understand how developmental decisions take place. The second type of cells are adult stem cells, and these are found in every tissue or organ type, and their primary function is basically to repair and maintain that organ uh, effectively. Uh, so their potency is sort of reduced and their uh, ability is sort of restricted to repairing and taking care of that particular organ or tissue in which they reside. The third type of stem cell is an engineered type of stem cell called induced pluripotent stem cells, uh, which won the Nobel in 2000 and, uh, 2012. Uh, so the first paper came out in 2006 where they used a cocktail of uh, genes, which when you overexpress them in uh, any other cell, you can force that cell to be converted into an embryonic stem cell-like cell. However, 60 years before that, Sir John Gurdon had already shown through a very complicated technique called somatic cell nuclear transfer that you can remove um, the nucleus from any cell and put it into an oocyte from which you have removed its nucleus. And this cell then has the ability to give rise to an entire organism. In other words, induced pluripotent stem cells are a way by which you can take any differentiated cell and uh, change its potency back to that of a cell very early in development. So these, uh, and as you can imagine, induced pluripotent stem cells can now be used for personalized medicine, for understanding um, disease progression, for, trust, for testing out various drug regimens to find out which is more effective uh, for a particular person suffering from any specific disease. So those are the three types of uh, stem cells that one broadly talks and works about. So uh, what are the other biotechnological applications of stem cells right now in the industry? 
So there are a lot of things one can do with stem cells. Pretty much the sky is the limit. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, one can think about it for cell replacement therapies using induced pluripotent stem cells. One can also use them to form these three-dimensional structures uh, which resemble mini organs. And uh, a lot of cell culture is done in the two-dimensional format where you're just looking at cells growing on a plastic plate or a glass dish. However, uh, in our body, organs and organ systems are all three-dimensional. So one can use stem cells to build these mini organs. Why would one do that? One would do that to understand how development happens. You know, if you're looking at a developmental disorder, you need to understand what is going wrong during the process of development. The second thing you can do is you can use these mini organs or even the two-dimensional cell types uh, to test drugs and to sort of come up with a personalized uh, therapeutic regimen for each patient. So what one can do is, uh, you know, create induced pluripotent stem cells, let's say just as an example for, you know, the patient one is looking at, and try and uh, differentiate them into the cell types we are interested in understanding and treat them with a range of concentrations and combinations of drugs to come up with a combination which is most specific and effective for that person. And this is something where medicine is moving towards because people know that every drug does not work with the same efficacy for every person. So you want to try and sort of build a personalized a treatment regimen um, for patients. And induced pluripotent stem cells is definitely a way of doing that. The third thing one can think of is, you know, grow these uh, induced pluripotent stem cells into mini organs and think about transplantation or transplanting them into a person who, let's say, has a cell-based disorder. So there are many things uh, one can do with these. Okay. So what research is going on in the Deepa Subramanian's lab at NCCS? Yeah, so we are trying to understand the basic nature of stem cells. You see, if we really have to take stem cells to patients and make sure that they are safe, they are effective, they do not, let's say, form tumors, one has to first understand what is a stem cell and what all regulates a stem cell. And it's important to have uh, sufficient information about stem cells so that once we reach the stage where we can put them into patients, we do not have unnecessary side effects. So one of the things we are looking at in the lab, which is really not uh, heavily studied in the field of stem cells, is to understand how the movement of molecules within uh, stem cells can regulate or affect their choice of fate when they differentiate. And this involves the process of vesicular trafficking or endocytosis, which is uh, basically using these membrane-bound vesicles to transport molecules to different parts of the cell, specifically from the plasma membrane to within and from inside to out again. And by this, uh, you know, one can achieve very uh, quick movements of molecules and thereby change, let's say, local concentrations of molecules, which may then trigger certain signaling events which can make a cell decide that, okay, you know, I've got this change in concentration, perhaps I should switch to becoming a neuron or to a blood cell and, you know, leave the stem cell environment. So we're looking at movements of molecules uh, through the process of vesicular trafficking and how this affects what choice a stem cell makes when it decides to differentiate. So, like, what techniques, like, how do you, like, uh, look at these vesicles actually in the lab? Like, what te techniques do you use? Yeah, so we use a bunch of different techniques. Uh, we grow stem cells, we differentiate them, we use, um, uh, you know, labeled molecules to study the movement of um, these molecules within stem cells. We also do a lot of uh, genome engineering using CRISPR-Cas9 to make specific knockouts, which will then remove uh, certain molecules which play a vital role in vesicular trafficking, then study how that affects stem cell behavior, stem cell differentiation. We also use siRNAs, uh, which, is, uh, which allows a knockdown or a reduction in the level of uh, the mRNA, which encodes for that protein rather than a complete removal. And we've done large uh, scale screens using siRNAs to look at you know, the role of at least a thousand different molecules which are involved in vesicular trafficking and ask how these affect uh, stem cell fate and differentiation. Can you please elaborate on siRNA process that you use? Right. So uh, when I say we do an siRNA-based screen, siRNA is small interfering RNA. Uh, and this, um, the way we use it is we get these synthetically uh, generated siRNAs. Each siRNA uh, binds to a particular mRNA or a transcript. So um, if we uh, 
if we remember our basic, uh, you know, uh, biology from the genome, uh, parts of the genome encode for an mRNA or a messenger RNA, which then get translated into a protein. And if you use these small interfering RNAs, they will bind to the mRNA and then allow the recruitment of specific uh, protein complexes, which will then chew up the mRNA, resulting in a destruction of that mRNA. So effectively, what you've done is you've knocked down or you reduce the amount of mRNA of that particular type which is present in a cell, and thereby you will eventually reduce the amount of protein that, that mRNA can code for. So what you're looking for is a reduction in the level of a particular protein uh, using a very specific sequence. Yeah. So rather than getting the genome, you right. just uh, uh, make the uh, mRNA, like it, if the mRNA is not able to function, yeah. then there will be no protein. Because when you cut the genome, it's a permanent yeah. cut. You cannot restore it. However, with an siRNA, when you remove the siRNA, uh, you know, you should go back to original levels. So you're looking more at more of a decrease rather than a complete knockout. So what we've done is you can um, use siRNAs to screen um, a large number of genes. You can either screen the entire genome, which is every single gene which is present in an organism, or you can pick and choose a set of genes, which is what we did. We put together a collection of over a thousand genes, which we believed were important in vesicular transport or trafficking. And we designed siRNAs against each of these and introduced these into individual wells which contained stem cells and then asked when we remove a particular or when we knock down a particular mRNA, what is the effect on stem cells? And thereby we are trying to build a network of genes which are involved in stem cells which regulate their stemness or pluripotency by doing this siRNA based screen. So how do you actually visualize the effect of gene editing? Like <laughs> how? That's a great question. So uh, there are multiple ways of doing it. If you have a readout of stemness, that's one way of doing it, uh, which is what we initially did. Uh, there are certain proteins which are present in stem cells, and you can measure the level of um, the extent of the protein. And you can do this in a calorimetric way so that you can do a high throughput um, type of screening, and you don't have to individually go into each well and, let's say, run a Western or um, something like that. So. In the first version of the screen, what we did was we used a protein called alkaline phosphatase, which is a readout of stemness, and um, we assessed the activity of alkaline phosphatase, which was present. So when there is high level, when there is a high level of alkaline phosphatase, it indicates that your stem cell is a real stem cell, and the level of alkaline phosphatase basically decreases as the stem cell differentiates. And uh, there is an enzymatic reaction which you can use, which gives a calorimetric readout. And just by uh, seeing how much color there is in that particular well, you can have a, a decent correlation of whether a cell is more stem-like or it's differentiated. The other thing you can do is there are transcription factors which are very specific for stem cells. And you can tag these transcription factors to a fluorescent protein, let's say GFP. And again, the amount of expression of the transcription factor is uh, correlated to how stem-like the cell is. So just by measuring the amount of GFP after one has done uh, one's siRNA knockdown, you can ask whether the cell is still a stem cell or whether it's left the stem-like state and it's differentiated. One more thing I was uh, having a doubt with. Uh, so when you do gene editing, like you cut out the gene, how do you know that that gene is uh, somehow responsible for cell trafficking? Okay. So we start out with a list because cell trafficking or intracellular trafficking is something which has been studied for many decades. We are not the first ones to do it. Uh, however, we are interested in looking at it in the context of stem cells. So there's already a, a lot known about the molecules which are involved in trafficking. And in combination with our screening strategy, as well as what is there in the literature, there's quite an extensive list of molecules which are known to be involved in this. So we are starting with some of these molecules, uh, specifically focusing on the clathrin-mediated endocytic pathway, um, trying to understand which components of this are critical for stem cell uh, pluripotency or stemness, and which ones are involved, uh, you know, or when you remove certain of these molecules, do they cause a differentiation of stem cells? Thank you for your time. That's all I had in mind. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you.